Okay, from what you learned yesterday, what's the internet as opposed to the World Wide Web? Remember to shout it out. Yes, the internet is the physical manifestation, the clients and the servers. That is a very good way to put it. Okay, so that is what the internet is. It's the, the, the tubes on which, yes, it's a series of tubes. That's an old joke from the internet. So have you heard that one before? Yes, the internet is a series of tubes. It's in a lot of ways, if you had something like a literal metaphor, it's pretty accurate actually in a lot of ways. All right, it is though, I mean, it's a joke and we call it the inner tubes, but the truth is, is that the internet is the physical manifestation. Sometimes we, we call it the, the figurative literal, all right? So what are the messages getting passed around? We already talked about one of the kinds of messages that, get, that gets passed over this physical network. And by physical, remember I am including things like radio waves, data transfer, cell towers, things like that too. So just because there's not a literal wire between the two places doesn't mean it's not part of the internet. So what's the difference? What is the World Wide Web as opposed to the internet? Is it composed of all of the information from the whole world? That is a very good guess, and that is that while it is, um, it's not exactly what it is, the Venn diagram of all of the information in the world and what the World Wide Web is does touch on each other. Go ahead. Um, was it like the destination? Was it like the destination? Or the, the internet? Uh huh. And then like the World Wide Web is the destination. Streets are the internet. All of the houses are the internet. Still part of the internet. What's the postman carrying? The mail. Also information, newspapers, all of the stuffs, right? It is, the software of the internet isn't quite right, although again we're overlapping with what it is. Getting closer. Non-physical, that's also a very good guess. The World Wide Web is the series of links that connect web pages together. All right? The World Wide Web is literally the web of links, linking pages all around the internet. And that is how you can have an, a, a web page that is not part of the World Wide Web. If it doesn't link to anything and no one knows it's there, is it really part of a World Wide Web? Right? It's not a philosophical question, it is a literal one. A web page that doesn't link anywhere that no one knows exists and sits on a server without being connected to the internet is not part of the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web is the vast, gigantic, interlocking network of all web pages everywhere. You can have subwebs. You can have webs that aren't connected to the World Wide Web. Anyone ever heard of Darknet? Mm -hmm. That is a different kind of web that doesn't touch the World Wide Web. And, and I'm drastically oversimplifying here. Ever heard of an intranet before? Right, that is when you'll have a single site, a sing and I mean a physical site like Seattle Central College, that has an interlocking sub web of web pages that all link back and forth to one another, but don't touch the outside world. The internal web pages that you, that you link to here, it's not part of the World Wide Web. You can get to it, from the World Wide Web, but there's pieces of it that you just can't get access to unless you literally change away from accessing the World Wide Web to physically accessing a server of some kind, getting in there, and then being able to touch all the web pages that are in that subnet. Okay? That's what the World Wide Web is. And you had a question? Is the metaphor or the World Wide Web the same thing as the spider web? Or the dimension? It's not a metaphor. The World Wide Web is a, is, is, and I keep using the word literal, but that this is the difference between literal and figurative and metaphor. The World Wide Web is, is literal. It exists. It's not a metaphor for anything. We call something interconnected to one another a web. So if you've ever linked to a web page, if you've ever um, put a link on one web page that leads to another one, you have helped create a piece of the World Wide Web. That is what the World Wide Web is. Any questions? Want to know what that is? Okay. Here's the interesting part of the question. How does it know how to get someplace? What happens when you type in theterra.com into your URL bars and you are taken to 
theterra.com. We understand what it means on a physical level. You end up at that server and then say, hey, can I look at the, the, the web page that you've got here? But yesterday what I said was, it's magic. And that's how it happens. It's not magic. Let's unpack magic a little bit here and talk about how it is that your Firefox or your Chrome or your Safari or your Internet Explorer uh, all know how to get someplace. Okay. What is DNS? Domain name server. Yes. All right. Domain name servers are how we figure out how to get places. Okay. Now, you heard me use a term a couple of days ago called a fully qualified domain name. Theterra.com is a very good example of a fully qualified domain name. It is, um, it's not really the address you're going to, or rather, it's a very specific address inside a bigger address. Imagine that in our house where Theterra.com lives on the server, that there's lots of different people living there, lots of different websites. Now, you could address a piece of mail or make a request or go visit someone's house and just know where that house is and know that the Smith family lives there, right? And if the Smith family lives there, that's great, you've gone and visited. But if you don't know specifically who you're going to visit or you don't know how, what their name is, you can't find them in the house, right? Imagine that you are addressing a piece of mail, someone, let them in. Imagine that you're addressing a piece of mail to Jane Smith. And Jane Smith is at the Smith residence when you send the piece of mail to that person's house, the fact that you have specified that it's Jane Smith that you're talking to is why Jane Smith is going to be the one who ends up getting that piece of mail or getting that request from you, right? But if all you put there is not the Smith family, not Jane Smith, just 123 Main Street, Anytown, USA, 10023, then what happens? There's no name, just the address of the house. What, what do you think happens then? I mean, in, in the real world, what happens when you try to send something to an address and you don't have the name of the person to whom you're sending it? It gets returned to the sender. Or it just sits there at the house until someone looks at it and goes, that handwriting looks kind of familiar. Maybe I'll see if it's for me, right? Okay, so the reason we have fully qualified domain names is the exact same thing as making sure that the name is on the envelope. If you imagine the house's address, 123 Main Street, Anytown, USA, as an IP address, you would be very accurate with that. The IP address is the number of that server on the internet. Okay? You all looked up yesterday, uh, what is my IP address? And you saw um, a, a string of numbers. There were four sets of numbers separated by dots, right? It was a couple of numbers and then a dot, a couple of numbers and then a dot, a couple more numbers, dot, a couple more numbers, right? Does that sound very familiar? Do you know what I'm talking about? That is an IPv4 internet protocol address, okay? That is the exact same thing as the address of a house someplace without the name of the person who's supposed to get the message, all right? Does that make sense? Okay, so IPv4, just, I'm going to check in because you're all staring at me and doing the thing again where you're like, yes, I'm nodding my head, but I'm not actually sure. Is the metaphor of the house helping you understand what's happening here when it comes to internet protocol addresses, when it comes to the difference between a name like theterra.com and the IPv4 address of my server? Do you understand the difference? Is all right. Like sending a letter to Santa? Sending a letter to Santa. That's actually... a there's a couple of good metaphors for that, but not in this case, no. Um, it's, it's, there's other stuff that that's like, but not this right here. How many of you have looked up the IP address for theterra.com? Okay, what happens when you look up the IP address for theterra.com? What is it, like 168 something, 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 something? Okay, try typing in the IP address into your URL bars. Post the, uh, the, the IP into general chat so everybody can give it a shot. See what happens. I'm going to see some familiar pa uh, web pages on the, uh, the screens that I'm looking at around, this, around here. As soon as I see that happen, I'll know you guys have got the right idea going on. Enter in just that IP address for my server. You're going to see something very interesting. Do we see what's going on? Just the IP address?
just the IP address. Ah, now I see it over there. What are you looking at right there? What does that say up at the top? Apache to Ubuntu default page, quote, it works, exactly. That right there says, yes, there's a server here. Yes, it's running a web page, but you haven't told me whether or not you want this piece of information to go to Jane or Joe or Bob or Susan, okay? That is what happens when you enter in an IP address without a fully qualified domain name. Now, if you wanted to, you could take a look around and see what other sites are hosted at that server, but that's something you can all explore as we go on through the rest, through the rest of the class. Okay. Now that you see that, how does, for especially for something like theterra.com, how does your browser know to go to that IP address, that theterra.com is associated with that IP address, and if so, where physically it's located? Certificates is a very good guess, but that's not it. We've already talked about it a little bit. Domain name server. What's a domain name server? Sometimes they're just called uh, DNS servers or name servers. It is, that's also a good guess. It's not a server dedicated to one site. It's a server dedicated to being a gigantic lookup table. Okay? It just stores zillions of these, and when I say zillions, I mean up to 4 billion IPv4 addresses. Okay? Why is there 4 billion possible IPv4 addresses? That is, a, that is part of it, yes. They only use numbers and there's a certain number of limited digits in IPv4, right? You can't have more than three in the in each one of the spaces. So it's three and then three and then two and then two. Are some of them taken up by other things as well? Right? Yes, they are. Some of them are taken up by other things as well. And every single thing needs an address, right? You can't have a way to get information someplace until it has a unique identifier. And when the people that created the IPv4 protocol started looking at this and saying, okay, well, we, we need to have computers and everything have a way to find it. Well, we'll just use IPv4 because we've already got a couple of hundred people using this system already. It's clearly too late to change it. No one's ever going to use 4 billion IPv4 addresses. You, not so much. <laughs> we, are running in, we, we are running out of IPv4 addresses. We're way past 3 billion now. I don't even know how many there are left at this point. Yes? Is that why IPv6 exists? Exactly. That is why IPv6 exists. How many possible IPv6... Well, first of all, what, is, what does IPv6 look like? What does it mean? Four, it's uh, four digits in between each decimal instead. Not a decimal, but a colon. Good. It has letters and numbers. And what is that actually called? Very close. Hex. Hexadecimal. Yes. And how many of those are there, possibly? 3.4 are then... Yes, or 342 undecillion. undecillion. Yes, undecillion. How many is that? A lot. 10 to the 36. Or freaking lots. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots, right? And yet, when a computer's doing a lookup of that particular IPv6 address, it actually doesn't fundamentally take up a lot more time to look up that hex number as it did with an IPv4. Okay? Does this make some sense? All right. What questions do you have about why we would use a system like this? Does it make sense to you? Is that kind of the same reason we have uh, area codes? Yes, area codes. That's a really good analogy as well, too. This is very much like a telephone system where you use a phone number and you call someone up. But how does the system know what a phone number is and where to go? And the foggiest notion of it converts to binary back and forth. I can tell you that the reason we use area codes is so that it'll head to the equivalent in the phone system of a lookup table, right? And then also codes for different countries as well. Country codes, exactly. The international phone system. That is exactly what's happening here, at least on a metaphoric level. All right? So the reason that we do this, the reason we use these big lookup tables is so we know where to go find someone because it's not like you want to have 342 undecillion possibilities and then go, nope, 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 nope. Each one of those segments tells you which one to go to. What's a closer name server to hit? When you want to mail a letter to someone, when you want to send them a newspaper, or you want to get information from someone, you don't, if you are starting in Seattle and your friend is in Massachusetts, in Boston, you don't drive to the post office in Boston 
to mail the letter to your friend who lives a mile or two away. You drive to the post office here, or just drop a, mail, uh, a letter off, at the post office here where they have the capacity to look up and get you closer to that location via which part of the address? The zip code, exactly, the zip code. Why don't we use GPS? That is a really interesting question. Why don't we use GPS? DNS is a good analog for the GPS of the internet. It just starts getting you closer and closer and closer and it refines and gets closer as you get there. The reason why you couldn't use GPS is because, let's say we move these computers. Oh no, I'm just saying if you're mailing stuff. If you're mailing stuff, yeah. No, no, it's, it's very true. You're all coming up with really good analogies and what's more important for me right now than, than um, necessarily getting every single part of this exactly correct you know, whether or not it's 10 to the 35 or 10 to the 37, does it really matter at this point? The idea is to make sure that you understand that there, the system of name servers is there to start getting you closer to the location you want to get to. And your message, your request, your browser header says, here's a series of name servers I'm going to hit really quickly just to see how far away my message is, where I want to go to, how long it's going to take me to get that information back. It is actually true that web pages that are physically located on servers that are farther away from you do take longer to load. And there's a reason for that. They have to bump from server to server to complete your request. Okay, they're transferring through series of domain name servers. All right, it used to take a lot longer. You used to have to be very careful about how you would create things, but this, these systems are getting slowly better and global infrastructure is improving to the point where you can reach in fewer hops. There are a lot of very fundamental problems with domain name servers with, with the DNS system. Um, security researchers, one of whom is a, a really smart guy named Dan Kaminsky, have found some very serious problems with DNS. And one of the things I'm going to ask you to do in a little bit is start looking up what's wrong with DNS. What's really wrong with it? Why is Why are there problems with it? What are some possible improvements to it? I love the question about GPS and I love the question about whether or not we can identify in a different fashion. Can we globally tag and just kind of watch people and keep an ongoing cached database of where these physical machines are located? As we have more and more laptops or phones, does it even make sense anymore to have these devices tied to a physical location to hop to to get information, right? There's a lot of really interesting questions about this. So when you click on a link, it says, I should go to theterra.com, I should go to Dropbox or Google or YouTube. And the first thing that it does is goes and finds a DNS server, a name server, and says, OK, it looks like this IP range is located in Sweden. So I'm going to step over to a DNS server that I know is closer to Sweden and go, where's this? And it says, looks like this is probably in Stockholm. And then you go to Stockholm. All right. You, you don't do too many jumps anymore, but it used to be that you might have to bounce around the system for quite a while. The infrastructure is getting better over time. What's that? What's the difference between internet now versus dial-up? That is an awesome question. What is the difference between internet now versus dial-up? What is the difference? Speed. You don't dial-up. Wires. Why, why was dial-up slower? Because of the hardware used. Because of the hardware used. So it would be possible to have really fast dial-up? It is. There are limitations to really fast dial-up. Um, past the... Think of it like continually improving a propeller plane uh, to try to maximize airspeed when you should just switch to a jet engine if you want to go that fast is, is a reasonably good metaphor here. There, there's other stuff about why modems didn't work as fast as cable internet does, but basically it, it comes down to available bandwidth. You can just get more information at a time. It's, it, the, the funnel was this big on a modem, and the funnel is this big in cable internet. And yes? Yes, physical limitations on hardware. Gigabit internet. Bigger cables if they have to. And one last question. I also thought um, it was because, uh, so dial-up was originally made to transfer different kinds of data, and as data mm -hmm. kept improving, yes. there was better forms to do that. That's why we yes. still use dial-up as phone lines and such, because mm -hmm. it's better quality. Is it really why we use dial-up as phone lines? Because it's better quality? We don't need as much information sent when we're talking with this voice. That's true. Why are, why are other reasons why we might still use dial-up for phones? Because it's there. Because the infrastructure has not improved for it yet. Because voice over internet goes faster and is fundamentally profoundly cheaper than using the existing telephone infrastructure. Right? 
You could just get more information over those systems. That's why Skype and Google Hangout and using any kind of, of calling over your computer is in terms of bandwidth, in terms of the infrastructure wear and tear, what it takes to make it happen is orders of magnitude cheaper. Yeah, don't have to take away all the stuff we already got set up. I remember it was just a couple of years ago we switched away from analog to digital television. How many years had it been since most people had had digital television at that point? No. All right, folks, any very last questions about how DNS links, anything like that works? Do you have a, a good picture in your head of what happens when you click on a link or when you type a, a address into a URL bar? Nodheads, yes, if you get it. Good, very good, awesome. All right.